the cost of energy storage is going down so quickly that when you finance the purchase of energy storage, just like you finance your car, just like you finance your mortgage, your house, you'll be able to store one full day of electricity for about a dollar a day. We're sitting here in San Francisco with Tony Siba, who is a lecturer at Stanford University in the field of entrepreneurship, disruption, and clean energy. And he's also the author of Clean Disruption of Energy and Transportation. So thank you so much for sitting down with us. I'm sure this is going to be a really interesting discussion. Thanks for having me. All right, so let's, let's, let's start it off uh, pretty simple. For you, what is this clean disruption movement that you're speaking of in your book? New technologies, especially technologies that improve on an exponential basis year after year after year, uh, combine with new business models to essentially either destroy existing markets or radically transform them. For instance, digital cameras disrupted film cameras, cell phone telephony disrupted landline telephony, uh, Uber and Lyft, for instance, are disrupting the taxi industry. So this is called technology-based disruption. Um, when you apply the same methodology to energy and transportation, uh, essentially you come up with the conclusion that the whole energy and transportation industry, essentially about $12 trillion a year in revenues, are going to be disrupted by essentially four technologies. Solar energy, uh, energy storage, electric vehicles, and self-driving cars. And what that's going to do is make oil obsolete, make nuclear obsolete, make natural gas obsolete, make biofuels obsolete. So essentially the whole mode of energy and transportation that we've been using for the last 100 years is going to be obsolete within the next 10 to 15 years. And that is the clean disruption. So let's, let's get a little bit more into uh, how this disruption takes place in, in uh, financial markets and yeah. the economy. The model in energy, to be specific to energy that we have now, is that electricity flows one way and money flows the other way. When you have self-generation, meaning solar rooftop generation, that's cheaper than the cost of transmission, even if you generate uh, in your central gener generating station at a cost of zero, which is not possible, even if you take that God particle that we recently discovered and you somehow generate at zero, um, you still, when you add zero to the cost of transmission, it's going to be more expensive than self-generation. At that point, which I call God parity, the existing model of electricity generation and distribution doesn't have a prayer. Essentially, it's going to be about this green, not about being environmentally green, that folks are going to switch from the existing uh, model of energy to solar energy. Now, solar today is only 1% of the world's uh, electricity generation. It will get to 10% and 100%. And to do that, essentially, it's going to need trillions of dollars. So Wall Street will need to get onto the clean energy bandwagon and they have already started to do that. Cost of capital is the most important cost factor in clean energy. So when you buy dirty energy, uh, you're paying for the oil, for the nuclear, for the gas and so on. In the case of solar, the energy itself is free. It comes from the sun. It's free. So what you pay for is the solar panels. Now, solar panels are a technology. So we know how to cut the cost on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. And in fact, the cost of solar has gone down by about 22% every two years or so since 1970. So solar today is 200 times cheaper than it was in 1970, 200 times. Oil 
today is 16 times more expensive than it was uh, in the year 1970. So when you combine those numbers on a relative basis, you get that solar today is 3,000 times cheaper than it was in 1970. Solar continues to go down. We expect it to go down another 50% or so over the next four years, which means that by 2019, 2020, on a relative basis again, solar will have come down by about 6,000 times relative to oil. Do you think the oil industry should be losing sleep at this point? Because solar will continue to go down, right? Oil won't. Uh, if anything, the cost of pumping, whether it's gas or oil, is getting more expensive. We're having to dig in um, sands or offshore or whatnot, and that oil gets more and more and more expensive. Now, when you combine uh, the solar disruption that I just mentioned with the electric vehicle disruption. So uh, batteries, which are the main cost factor in uh, electric vehicles, are also going down on a yearly basis. Over the last four or five years, it's gone down by about 16% per year in cost. And if you just keep that curve going out five, 10, 15 years, it's by 2020, the average American household will be able to store a full day of electricity for about $1 per day. So when you combine the fact that you'll be able to store a full day of electricity for a dollar per day with the fact that you'll be able to self-generate at a cost that is going to be below the cost of transmission, essentially all utilities are going to have massive stranded assets. Central generation, refineries, uh, oil fields are going to be essentially stranded, obsolete. Um, whoever invests in that today uh, is going to lose a lot of money. And Wall Street is starting to get that message. Today, the biggest owner of solar in the U.S. is Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett has invested somewhere between 10 and 20 billion dollars in solar. And Warren Buffett is not a greenie in the environmentally you know, green way. He likes this green. Again, financial innovations have lowered the cost of capital for solar, which has meant that the market has gone up even more quickly, which has lowered the cost of capital, which makes the market grow even longer. And that is a virtuous cycle that essentially makes solar accelerate even more that makes the cost of capital go down even more, and which makes the, the disruption uh, of solar happen even faster. As Tesla and other energy companies invest in lithium-ion batteries, it pushes down the cost of lithium-ion batteries. That, in turn, basically makes solar more affordable. It's a technology cost curve that gets into a virtuous cycle for both the solar industry and the electric vehicle industry, which in turn means that they will both benefit, which in turn means that the disruption of both energy with mostly solar, but also wind and transportation, mostly because of electric vehicles, are going to even accelerate even, even more. Folks who are investing in coal plants, in offshore oil in tar sands and in that model of central generation and refining are essentially going to lose a lot of money and that disruption is going to start happening essentially uh, over the next few years over the next five years uh, you're going to start seeing a lot of bankruptcies a lot of what's called in the industry stranded assets the other thing that's worth mentioning is that when folks talk about solar or wind, they say, oh, but what about the subsidies? Um, what they don't say is that, the, according to the International Monetary Fund, fossil fuels get $5.3 trillion per year in government subsidies. $5.3 trillion. The whole industry is $8 trillion. So most of the energy industry is basically one massive subsidy 
from governments around the world. And um, I don't necessarily think that those subsidies are going to go away because um, energy is very entrenched in, in, in many governments. But what I am saying is that unsubsidized solar will disrupt subsidized fossil fuels and nuclear plants. Um, so because the technology cost curve is, is going down so quickly and because the cost of capital is going down so quickly. Um, and that's going to start really disrupting the industry within five years. And if you look at Germany, it's already started to happen. If you look at a company like E.ON, which was Germany's largest utility, they already decided to split off their business and get rid of all central generating power, nuclear, coal, and hydro. So it's not that they decided to be cleaner, it's that the economics of solar and wind uh, are a no-brainer. And they decided that that is not just the future, that is also the present. And again, when you have that and you also have electric vehicles, which are going to disrupt conventional gasoline cars, essentially you're going to have the whole energy and transportation industry that's going to be disrupted. In 10 years, by 2025 to 2030, all new vehicles will be electric. There's basically no way around that. The technology cost curve of batteries and power electronics and so on point in that direction. So this is not about wishful thinking or anything like that. The technology cost curve is pointing in that direction. And the same thing that digital cameras did to film cameras, uh, electric vehicles are going to do to uh, gasoline vehicles. Transportation is 80% of the usage of oil. So what's going to happen with oil? The market's going to shrink massively and only the low cost producers are going to be able to survive. Now, there are a lot of products that you can make with oil and gas, fertilizers and plastics and so on, and those might be the only markets left for oil. But the other disruption to gasoline cars and to oil is going to be the self-driving car disruption. It's a computer on wheels. You have cars with a number of sensors and it can create a three-dimensional map of the world around them. Um, and with that, it can tell whether this is a person, that is a tree, this is a car, this is a cat, and so on. Now, the technology cost curve has been unbelievable, and it went from 70,000 to 1,000. So now a self-driving car is very affordable. Um, it's only an extra thousand dollars or so. To process all of that sensor information, you need a GPU, the equivalent of a supercomputer. Now, that is also improving exponentially. The world's most powerful supercomputer in the year 2000 was used at Sandia National Labs in New Mexico, and it cost $46 million. The equivalent of that computer you can buy today and hold in your hands for $59. So it went from 50 million to $50 in 15 years, right? That's a million times improvement in 15 years. That's what Silicon Valley does. Those are the key technologies to making self-driving cars. One now costs $59. The other one is gonna cost a couple hundred bucks within a couple of years. So you'll be able to have cars that drive themselves. We use our cars only 4% of the time today. We park our cars 96% of the time. That is a huge waste of money. Uh, that's a huge waste of resources. So if you assume we're going to go from a world where cars are parked 90% of the time to a world where they're going to be driving 90% of the time, what happens? Essentially, we're going to need fewer cars. So the car, the automotive market, we make about 100 million cars a year today. 
we're only going to need 20% of that. Uh, from, from your research, is the, uh, the solar and wind industry ready for this scaling up? Because, you know, if solar and all of the materials and minerals used to make these panels yes. is only making up 1% mm -hmm. of the market right now, yes. what's going to happen in terms of finding these minerals and making these uh, these panels once we start to bring it up? Since the year 2000, solar has essentially doubled the market every two years. So today it's about 130 times bigger than it was in the year 2000, much bigger than anyone anticipated in the year 2000. And if it keeps growing at this rate, basically doubling every two years, the question is how many more doublings do we need before solar is 100% of the world's energy? And the answer is seven. Uh, are we going to have enough material for solar panels to do this? Solar is essentially silicon. It's sand. Silicon is one of the most abundant elements in the world. Every computer uses silicon, and we have billions of computers. Every cell phone uses silicon, and we haven't had any issues you know, scaling from only a few cell phones 20 years ago to 6 billion cell phones around the world today. I know people who've done the math and we have more than plenty of materials to do all solar. And in fact, one of the misconceptions about solar is that we need a lot of land to generate all the energy that every single house, every single airport, every single factory, every single business in the U.S. uses every year. We need about 10,000 square miles of solar. So that's, if you were to put it all in one square, it would be a square that went 100 by 100. The U.S. oil and gas industry leases 150,000 square miles of land and water to pump oil and gas to produce about a third of our energy needs. 150 thousand square miles. Today, oil and gas is using 15 times the area that solar would use to power the whole United States. And I'll give you another data point that's pretty interesting. In the U.S., we have up to 13,000 square miles of parking. If all you do in the U.S. is take all that parking and put solar canopies on, on parking lots, you could generate all the energy that the whole United States needs to power itself for a year. A lot of people think if we go all electric vehicles, that's going to use a lot of energy, right? Where are we going to get all that energy? So I did the numbers for the United States. And in the US, we travel about 3 trillion miles per year. So if all vehicle miles were electric in the US and all of those miles were powered by solar, how many square miles of solar would we need? 1,000. So if all we do is take 10% of our parking lots and we convert that to solar, basically solar canopies on 10% of parking lots in the US, you could power every single electric vehicle in the United States for the whole year. If Walmart, one company, Walmart, put up solar on all its rooftops and parking lots, Walmart alone could generate 20% of all the energy that all the EVs in America would need for the whole year. We don't need that much power to make the transition to a full clean disruption solar plus EV economy. In fact, we need much less uh, in terms of materials, resources, water, uh, and land that, than we use now for um, you know, oil, gas, nukes, and, and so on. Just to finish up the, the kind of conversation on the scale of things, uh, do you have any uh, data points on lithium batteries and, and, and how abundant lithium is yeah. in our world? 
there are a lot of other elements that go into a lithium ion battery and lithium is only 5%. Now we need that lithium, but it's only a small part of the lithium ion battery. And with the data that we have today, uh, essentially we could power um, a billion uh, electric vehicles with the available lithium that we have in the world. And that's not even assuming uh, new deposits, new mines that we have not even discovered, let alone developed. Um, and, and if one country, Bolivia, uh, were to open up, and it hasn't just yet, uh, that in and of itself would be an order of magnitude bigger than any other lithium mine that we have anywhere in the world. So lithium is a very abundant element around the world. And um, that also, by the way, assumes that lithium is going to be the only source of uh, batteries in 10 or 15 years. Now, over the next five or seven years, yes, it's going to be lithium ion batteries, but uh, there are a lot of companies working on other chemistries other forms of uh, storage that might be five to ten times more energy dense and cheaper than lithium-ion batteries. So uh, we have a lot of lithium to go for many years, uh, but we also have other innovations that may even disrupt lithium-ion itself. In your experience, looking at, at this field of, of, of clean energy and transportation, yes. What have been some of the largest barriers? And A, are these barriers enough to stop this from growing in the way that you imagine? And also B, how much quicker could it grow yeah. if certain areas of governments or industries were to take the lead on this? Yeah, despite what the media will tell you, this is happening despite governments, not because of governments. Um, so the biggest barrier right now to an even faster adoption of clean energy, of solar and wind and, and electric vehicles and so on, is you know what you would call regulatory capture. Essentially when the regulatory bodies, organizations in the government, the public utility commissions and departments of energy and so on, end up regulating the public on behalf of uh, the industries, right? That's called regulatory capture. Um, many of them are anti-solar, many of them are anti-electric vehicles. I'll tell you, you know, a couple of examples. One is that in Ohio, to have a solar power plant, you need to pay, even if it's on your home, you need to pay $150,000 to have a small power, you know, rooftop solar, $150,000. That's outrageous, right? But that's something that the legislature passed in Ohio. I mean, up until recently, in the state of Georgia, basically, if you were a homeowner and you wanted to do a solar power purchase agreement, basically have third-party finance, have someone else finance solar on your rooftop, Basically, it was not legal um, because the legislature said so. And yeah, exactly. So um, they made it legal uh, essentially after the local utility acquired the solar company and decided to get into the solar business. Then it became legal to do solar PPAs. And you see examples like these where, you know, the, the, the regulators who are supposed to be working for the public are instead working against the public for, uh, you know, the industry. No private company on earth will insure a nuclear reactor. None. Taxpayers are the ones who insure nuclear power today. So, if there is a nuclear disaster, as in Chernobyl or as in Fukushima, it's the taxpayer who's going to end up paying for it. And according to a German report, the cost of a nuclear disaster like Chernobyl or Fukushima, if it were privately insured, it would be somewhere around $5 trillion. So that's why no private insurance will insure nukes. 
So when nuclear power companies tell you that they're cheap or safe, they're not including the cost of insurance, which is borne by the taxpayer. There would be zero commercial nuclear power plants if it was dependent on the private market to ensure nuclear accidents. We would have zero. And it's interesting because, you know, energy is, is a very political thing, uh, unlike technology, for instance, and people take sides. And to me, it's a technology, right? I mean, energy is energy. And it's sad that, for instance, um, the, the, the right wing of, of many countries have uh, taken an anti-solar, anti-clean energy position, when in fact, solar is the most libertarian form of energy there is. I mean, today, if you want to basically self-generate all the power that you need and want, the only way to do that is really to do solar. This disruption is happening despite the governments, despite what the legislatures are doing against solar, not because of that. So what I tell policymakers when I meet with them is that you can either lead or follow. And if you lead, then you can create the jobs in your region, in your country. Uh, you can create the Silicon Valleys that are going to create all of the Googles and the Facebooks and the Cisco's and the Apples of clean energy and transportation rather than them being created somewhere else and you having to essentially import those technologies, which somebody's going to have to do it, right? Um, so it's all about jobs, jobs, jobs to policymakers at the end of the day. And just to give you uh, an idea, in the US, solar already has twice the number of workers as the coal industry. And solar is only 1% of the market. I mean, imagine how many more solar workers we're going to have when solar is 10%, 20%, 100%, many more, right? So if you want to create the jobs, if you want to create the technologies, if you want to create the wealth, then you better lead uh, because this clean disruption is inevitable. It's going to happen whether you want it or not. Don't resist. Lead this disruption. You either disrupt or you're disrupted. It's your choice. No one likes being disrupted in any kind of way. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, politicians uh, want to be reelected. You know, to be reelected, you need two things money and votes. The votes are going to be a counterweight to all the money from energy that goes into politicians. And so that speaks to the fact that if you want to accelerate this inevitable disruption, then you should go out and vote for the politicians that will support clean energy, the politicians that will support solar and wind and electric vehicles and car sharing and so on, not the politicians that are going to vote against. So today, solar is about people power. Well, Tony, we can't thank you enough for, for giving us this time and for, for really outlining this in a way that everyone can understand and, you know, taking away the kind of political aspect of things. Because I think that at the end of the day, it really is just about, is this better for us? in every way, you know? It's better for us and it'll happen. It, you know, thankfully, uh, for, you know, future generations, it's gonna happen. This is a technology disruption, it is gonna happen. And at the same time, it's going to be great for the world. It's going to save millions of lives uh, around the world. It's gonna make our water cleaner, our air cleaner. Uh, we're gonna cause less pollution. It's just great all around. And it's great to know that a technology disruption is going to be also great for humanity. And thanks for doing what you do. This feels really great. Thank okay. you so much. My pleasure. All right. Yeah. yeah.